companionship and group loyalty and power. They get together and they can frighten people who might ordinarily frighten them. And especially now, they get, well, since the California Attorney General did an, an official report on them, they got a massive amount of attention and publicity, national publicity. They made, made the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, movies, you know, this book. And there'd be no other way for these people to do this without going out and you know, doing something like the Boston Strangler or the Mad Bomber. You know, it's, it's an easy way to get what they can't get in the, in the, the square world. It's a, it's a whole subculture of dropouts and uh, washouts and people who just can't make it in this automated, you know, technological society. They vary from the big ones, the runs, to uh, just almost a continuing round of beer parties here and there. But on a run, they might get 150 bikes to anywhere up to 300 in some, uh, say, a state park somewhere, and they park them in a big ring around the massive bonfire, 10 or 15 feet tall. And they buy about, oh, $100 worth of beer, say, for to, just as a starter, sort of in the afternoon. And they'll drink hundreds of dollars worth of beer in a matter of two or three days. They'll clean, they've actually cleaned out the whole town's beer supplies. At the same time, they're taking oh, amphetamine pills, you know, to... LSD? Well, that comes a little later. They start off with pills, uh, you know, barbiturates and amphetamines, mixing them all together, then beer, then the wine starts. And later on, there'll be some LSD, and everything gets mixed in all together. And this, this goes, they don't, they try not to sleep. And they get wilder and wilder and you, uh, they don't recognize each other and they begin, people begin to scream and whip on trees with chains and... Uh, it just, it turns into sort of a, just a bedlam, you know. Uh, well, I remember one <laughs> reporter from the Los Angeles Times showed up when, at one of them. And he showed up at noon after the whole, when most people were wasted and still sort of asleep. He said it looked like Dante's Inferno. Mr. Thompson, what is your book attempt? And, uh, I'm going to try to link them to the other people like, you know, like the Hells Angels, who don't wear the colors. Like I say, there are thousands of uh, losers and thugs and muggers and petty criminals who would like to have this kind of attention, but don't. Well, to summarize, how would you explain a Hells Angel? Oh, he's be between 20 and 40, more likely around late 20s. He'd have a, he'd be a high school dropout. I'm talking about a very typical one. Mm. A high school dropout. Uh, he'd have a minor police record with a, a lot of arrests and few convictions or anything serious. Maybe a year or so in jail at different times for small things. Uh, he'd be a motorcycle freak, you know, in, in sort of a lifetime sort of bike rider and uh, that would get him into the hells I mean, that would make him eligible after that he becomes a sort of a creature of the club and he gets more and more bizarre and uh, ten his, his police record will start piling up because he's much more obvious do you have to have a police record to be uh, eligible for the club no, so to speak if you're eligible for the club, it's assumed that you have a police record. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, nobody really cares. I think there was only one angel who had never been arrested when he got in, and he was arrested almost one, almost at once, mm -hmm. immediately after he got in. I've forgotten what for. What would you say that uh, the organization does for what you describe as a loser in society? You spent at least a year knowing them and living with them. What were your most vivid impressions of them? Vivid impressions? Well, visually, I, there's nothing, no sight that I can think of that compares to the, the these Labor Day runs where they get several hundred bikes out on the road. What is a run exactly? Oh, a run is just a sort of a giant picnic or outing. They, it's where they gather in one spot in the city and then go to some sort of vacation you know, in the mountains or beach or somewhere all together for a great big three or four day party. And that's when they really frighten people because they're all together and they they dress in the wildest way they can and they're all drunk out of their minds you know, and eating pills. And it's like an army of Huns that moved into your town. 
They don't, necess they don't necessarily go to destroy the place, but they work themselves into such a frenzy, and there's so many of them. And of course, the town, you know, the townspeople are all worried and frightened, and they're carrying weapons and lying over the doors locked, and their daughters in the basement, and that sort of thing. So it creates a very tense situation. The slightest thing can blow into a riot or an attack, or, you know, and the police can't really handle two or three hundred of them running wild and without a lot of reinforcements. Sometimes in your book you almost get the impression you're saying that uh, their no notoriety is overstated. Yeah, that links up with what I said about explaining them. The Hells Angels themselves aren't as dangerous, or they're not nearly as much of a menace as they seem to be. But if you just drop it at that and go on to, you know, say, well, they're not so dangerous, ignore them, then you miss the whole point uh, that I was getting at in the book about the Hells Angels just being thousands of other losers just by uh, some other name. Resentment, and this resentment builds up. And, well, I, I, I'm much more aware of it now after mm. you know, this sort of thing. I see Hells Angels everywhere. They don't all wear colors. Mm -hmm. New York is full of them, I'm sure, Chicago. Are these kind of people hopeless? I mean, after observing them for, for a year and, and uh, you say they can't make it in this automated society, is it, is it a hopeless cause? Well, they're hopeless as long as they decide to stay Hell's Angels. I mean, hopeless in the sense that you're talking about. They're not hopeless to themselves. But as long as they insist on being that obvious, uh, would you hire somebody with a gold earring and a shoulder-length hair and stinking of all manner of grease and slime with a police record two feet long? Mm -hmm. They're not really eligible, eligible for, for good jobs. Now, if they decided to quit this, you know, shave Do many ever s decide to quit? Mm, you know, not, I'm not sure what the percentage would be. There are three ways to stop being a hell's angel. One is to, to die, and a lot of them do that. Others to go to prison, and a lot do that. And the other is to quit. Uh, but I guess it'd be about, well, more quit than go to prison, and more go to prison than die. But those are the three exits that they can make. Is it difficult to quit? Are there any reprisals from the group if you do? Mm, depends on why you quit. Sometimes there are, but uh, and it depends on when you quit. Mm. It's more. It gets harder and harder as you get older because you've built up more of a police record and your friends become more of an in-group, mm -hmm. an outlaw thing. I remember one of them saying that he'd like to quit, but he didn't have friends anywhere else. He didn't know how. What usually motivates a man to qu to just quit? Well, it depends on how intelligent he is. But say if he joins it. 21 or something, and if he has sense, and quite a few of them have uh, you know, enough sense to Do sort of they? understand their situation, and they don't understand how to, you know, how to handle it. Mm -hmm. But the, those who, who have a sense of options begin to realize that as they approach 30, they're losing all their options. You know, it's, it gets harder to get a job, it gets mm -hmm. harder to find new friends, harder to do almost everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, once past 30, they're sort of confirmed. They, then it's either jail or a bad crash on a bike or getting shot by somebody. Mm -hmm. The younger ones quit fairly often. What, when was the uh, organization Hell's Angels actually originated? And how was it originated? Well, it started in 1950 in a town called Fontana, near San Bernardino, which is near Los Angeles. And motorcycles were a big thing after the war. The California was full of people who'd come back from the Pacific War and they were all sort of the same age and they all had money and motorcycles just sort of caught on. And there were all kinds of motorcycle clubs started. Enough so that in 1947, either two, three or four thousand descended on a town called Hollister near San Francisco. And that was the first really big, what they call a motorcycle riot. And the movie The Wild One was based on that. Yeah, how much influence did that have on the Hells Angels? Oh, a lot. It gave them an image of themselves. You know, they, they identified with Brando instead of Lee Marvin, who was really a much more valid uh, picture of, mm -hmm. of what, the, what the outlaws were. But, if, you know, say that if there were 4,000 in Hollister, perhaps two or 300 were really outlaws. Mm -hmm. The others were the same kind of people who are riding motorcycles around now, sort of what they call respectable types. Mm -hmm. And they're always worried that the Hells Angels are going to blacken their image, which they do. 
A lot of people just don't like motorcycles, period, because of the Hells Angels. It makes it hard to ride on the highways when people are trying to run over you and throw beer cans at you. I've had that happen. What's the relationship between the motorcycle and the personality of the Hells Angels? Do you think there is one? Um, the reason yeah, why it appeals so much to them? Well, obviously, yeah. It's, it's like carrying a massive gun or a bazooka around the streets. It, uh, it gives them a tremendous sense of power and freedom and uh, it makes them so makes them very obvious you can't ignore a hell's angel on one of his they call chopped hogs mm. booming up and down the street the thing rattles windows and frightens pedestrians and that sort of thing so it, without a motorcycle he'd be just, just another punk mm -hmm. but uh, well it's 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 a what they what I called an equalizer you pointed out one time um, in the book that sometimes they get an almost perverse pleasure in being exceedingly nice be to crash their image. Yeah, when they go into a situation where people are obviously frightened of them, they already have the attention that they're looking for anyway, so it isn't necessary to tear up a place because then, the, then it makes it sort of unpleasant to get, you know, if you get arrested and somebody might get cut. So as long as they get the attention that they, they're really looking for, then uh, they enjoy it. You know, they enjoy the setting up this tense situation and mm -hmm. seeing people, you know, sort of like this. And mm -hmm. yes, sir, you want some more coffee? That, mm -hmm. that sort of business. Mm -hmm. But then that it doesn't always hold true. They'll take advantage of these things a lot. What uh, you talked earlier about common sense, and you said some of them really do have common sense. We're out, huh? Wait, can we cut it a sec? You spoke about the intelligence of the Hells Angels, and you said some of them had real common sense. Would you say that uh, you found any geniuses among them? No, unless they were so, so disguised that I didn't recognize it. You do find people who are brighter than, you know, much brighter than average. Very, very few of those, but some. But at the same time that they might be brighter than average, they're also, they might be, you know, well, one of the brightest of the San Francisco angels uh, can't read, for instance. They didn't go to school beyond the third grade. But you find some who have a very articulate kind of instinct for what's happening, but they don't, they can't, they have a hard time saying it. But most of them are not very smart. I mean, actually, there's, well, I won't go into that. They're just not very smart. Nothing compared to the night before. I mean, he came with police at the at, at noon. You know, people take off their clothes and rush around, and girls are dragged around, and people start up motorcycles and do wheel stands around the fire. And it's, uh, you've got to watch you know, where you walk or where you stand. You're likely to be run over or attacked or set on fire, almost anything. Do they ever try to explain what they get out of an experience like this? <laughs> no, they don't bother to explain it. It's, it's either self-evident or doesn't matter. Is there any conclusion at all to be reached? About the Hells Angels? Uh, only that it represents a, a sort of growing menace that might or might not be called Hells Angels. They're, uh, these people are breeding all over the country, and the more complicated this, the job apparatus, you know, with the more qualified you have to be to get a job, the more people are going to be, you know, forced out off the job market. And, uh, well, their motorcycle clubs started starting everywhere and existing everywhere for that matter. But all these people don't ride motorcycles and they don't all wear jackets saying Hell's Angels, but they're all, they're, they're around. And there are more and more of them. You can draw your own conclusions from what's going to, about what's going to happen when they you know, when we get to a certain level, I'm not sure what the level would be. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.